see, seven C called This Is Today. It is, ain't it? This is yes. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has. I can't hear you. This rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I can't hear you. Hey, let's let our preacher get up here for a little while tonight and uh, see what he's got for us. Well, Lord, thank you once again today for uh, allowing us to come back here on Wednesday night one more time. Pray right now, if you would, bless our pastor. Give him everything that he needs to stand here and tell us all the great things that we need to hear one more time, Lord. And if you would, Lord, help us that we can go out tomorrow and uh, uh, show us tonight. You know who they are and what needs to be done. Well, I still remember, Lord, all the families of the little children up north, Lord, if you would just continue to watch them and you know, just hover over them, Lord, and just uh, love them and just encourage them and help them, Lord. So thank you for doing that in advance and for the other folks that's there, and if you would, please be with them. But Lord, tonight, one more time, we're going to tell you again that we love you, and then ask if you would, forgive us where we fail you, and uh, we're going to ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Wow, all all 15 of us <laughs> and about the services this coming week. Apparently, people thought I meant we weren't having services tonight. So, but anyway, we are. Well, hey, Sammy, slipped in the back door. Good to see you and Aaron. Like old times back there in that corner and JJ. So, all of you guys. So, guess what? <clears throat> Two more days. Twelve twenty-one. Ah. Y'all ready to go? Well, the Inca Indians said that the world was coming to an end in 12, 21, 12, and Notre Dame agreed with it, and they forgot to ask the only one who really knows, and that's God. We're back in the book of Exodus, still talking about the tabernacle. Guess what tonight? We're going to get to take a look on the inside. Actually go inside where God ministers to His people. In the tabernacle, we're going to look at the outside first, and we're going to see it as the world sees it. And I'm afraid to say as many so-called Christians see God today as just a, a judgmental God that just wants to take all the fun out of life. And so we're going to go have fun and, and make like we're a Christian. That's scary because you've got to face God one day anyway. Amen? you still got to face God. No matter how, how you try to get around it, you know, He's going to meet you. The Bible makes it plain that, you know, we are going to stand before Him. Those that don't know Him are going to stand before Him at the great white throne judgment. No matter what kind of profession of faith you've made, if there's no Christ in your life, uh, I'm sorry. It takes a redeemed human being, a changed human being to go to heaven. Amen? And not only God can do that, and He can only do it by grace. He does it by grace through faith. But a real change of life is also evident externally too. Amen? We get an inside perfection and an outside desire to be perfect. I didn't say we were externally. We know better. But if, if you and I don't have a desire 
to be holy, there's something wrong inside with our relationship with God. So, and we've looked at this as how, you know, I've had people ask me, it seems like God is just so precise in everything that he did right down to the inch when he was talking about to Moses to build the tabernacle. He is so, so exact. And this ought to let us know that, you know, we, we don't have any, we can either do it God's way. There's only two ways. God's way or our way, they never mix. Somebody say amen out here. It never mixes. It's either God's way or our way. And if it's our way, it's not God's way. And so it's hard for us sometimes to get that because we've been told that all you got to do is, you know, make a profession of faith and everything's okay. Well, let me tell you what. It certainly it takes a profession of faith, but a profession of faith that changes your life not just saying words and, and getting baptized and going through the motions. It takes a real life change. So the reason this is so important, God has already shown us that he didn't allow anyone to come beyond this point, the gate, if you will, the outer court. The Israelite, except the priests that ministered daily, they were not allowed. They were only allowed to come by proxy. That means that the priest had to take the offering that God demanded they bring, if they brought anything that was unacceptable before the Lord, their offering wasn't accepted. It was dismissed. And so we've seen all through this that God said it's my way. In order to get back here where God resides, you got to start out here where God demands. And meeting those demands have been, as we've seen, as, by the way, you, how many people have, have said this and maybe even thought this, uh, and you may be, have even been challenged when you think about the singularity of Jesus Christ as far as salvation. What I mean by that is the only way you can go to heaven is, is pure faith in Jesus Christ. You can't get there any other way. But the world says, well, you know what? It's just hard for me to believe that. What about these people that have never heard? How many of you have heard that argument? It's people who have never heard people on the Indians, on the islands, and all those things. What about, what about all them? Let me tell you what the Bible says, and you have one choice. Believe it or disbelieve it. And it's only two, that's two choices in it. Not really. It's only one. Because he says, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no man coming to the Father except by me. Now, again, humanity says, well, it's just hard for me to accept that. You don't have to accept it, but you will pay the consequences. That's the only problem. See, that's why this is so important, is that we're talking about the Old Testament of Israel when God was teaching Israel and teaching us also, because the Bible tells us that everything he taught Israel was for our admonition and our instruction. We're supposed to be instructed by what God was teaching Israel. And God said, set up the way people come to me. They cannot come into my presence except by the blood that's brought by the high priest. And our high priest is Jesus Christ. And the blood is the sacrificial lamb, which is also Jesus Christ. So he's set up the program that we have absolutely. Here's the wonderful part. Aren't you glad that God didn't leave any detail left out? Aren't you glad? Had he left anything left out, we'd be in the dark. But he made sure we knew exactly how to come to his son. So we're going to start tonight. We're going to look at the outside of the tabernacle proper. This is the, this is the outer wall. We've talked about it over and over, 75 feet by 150 feet, out in the middle and everywhere that the children of Israel went, the tabernacle was there. All during the wilderness march, 40 years, they marched, and everywhere they went, the high priest led with the, with the Ark of the Covenant, and they followed. And the tent was all folded up, and that's what the word tabernacle means. It means tent. God met his people in the tent. And outside was a seven and a half foot wall, approximately. And it, and the only gate they could come to was this one gate. Again, speaking of Jesus' singularity and salvation. And then from here in the outer court, that's where the offerings were made on the, on a daily basis. They were made on what's called the brazen altar, made of brass. And then, of course, the brazen labor for cleansing. But tonight we're going to look at this 45 by 15 foot tent. And if you've seen, you got the outside, you've got the diagram. Is there anyone here who has, does not have the diagram or have the drawings that would like to have one? All right, if you would, let's get one right down here, guys. 
Come on, we'll get one. Come on, Adam, take these. And also, you can have a picture of the high priest if you'd like in his garments. Take those and anyone, anyone else. If you want one, just stick your hand up. We'll make sure you get one, okay? Uh, we do happen to have some extra, thank goodness. But we're looking tonight, beginning in Exodus chapter 26, Exodus 26, beginning in verse 14, we're going to be talking about the coverings, and that's the covering of the tent itself. Remember, this tent was covered just like any other tent, except this was covered precisely. This wasn't canvas, and it wasn't just a little tent. Uh, Adam, have one more down here, please, when you get through it there. Uh, and this tent was made specific. For the dwelling place of God. And so we're going to be looking tonight at what God said and how that he instructed the builders to build this. Beginning in verse 14, but we'll wait just long enough to make sure. Uh, right down front here. Got somebody down here. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So we're looking at Exodus 26, beginning in verse 14. Give Adam time to get back to his seat so he can follow along with us. And here's what God said to those builders about covering for this tent. This place here would be covered and pitched, the roof pitched, and the tent made roundabout. And by the way, when it was enclosed, it absolutely you could not see inside from the outside, and you couldn't see the outside from the inside until the veil was pulled back. And the veil was only pulled back in order for the priest to go inside and minister. So the Bible says in chapter 26, verse 14, And thou shalt make a covering of the tent of ram skin dyed red, and a covering above it, one that goes above it, of badger skins. Now I want to stop just for a moment. And I did some research on what's called badger skin. Badger skin is very durable. has a tremendous, a tremendous waterproofing ability it has uh it's great rugged from the outside but it looks horrible uh, you would never choose it for human decor it's not something that's attractive and when i thought about that did the research on it and that's the first thing you see from the outside when you're looking at the tabernacle you can see the rise of the of the pitch of the tent and so the Israelite or anyone else looking toward the tabernacle, the, the outside didn't look very attractive. And you know what? The Bible says Jesus was not an attractive man. In fact, the Bible says there was nothing comely about him. It means that he was not, he was not an extraordinary handsome person. There was nothing outside of him that would cause someone to want to see. He was a very ordinary look according to the Bible. I've never seen a picture, and neither have you, and neither has any of those that have drawn all these pictures. How many do know that the picture that we now look at and call Jesus was actually a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, and he drew it as a contemporary man at his time, and of course he had no idea, and everybody thinks that they think about Jesus, they think that's what he looks like. Well, there's one thing I know he didn't have that's on the picture. He did not have long hair. Why? Paul said if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. Is everybody still breathing out there? I didn't write that. This is in 1 Corinthians. How many have read that before? Now, please, uh, I'm not trying to pick on anything external. I'm trying to show you that uh, Jesus would not. And by the way, most people say, most scholars, if you want to believe scholars, believe that his hair was cut kind of like a... Uh, now, by the way, somebody say, what's long? It, the Bible doesn't say, and I don't have a measuring tape. I don't run around trying to check people's haircuts. But... And by the way, if your heart's right, it won't matter. Uh, you, if you know something and your heart is where it ought to be, you won't let anything stand between you and being what you feel like God wants you to be. Amen? No matter what that is. But the point being made, someone says that in all probability, the hair, Jesus' hair was probably cut. How many have ever seen a bust of Caesar Augustus? You know, with a little short, little, like somebody turned a bowl over his head? That was a common or dare haircut of the time when Christ walked on the earth. But anyway, that was a that was a it's amazing what what we accept as being this, that or the other, rather than looking at scripture. Paul said he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And think about that. And then he wrote that. So think about that when you when you see these pictures and, and all of a sudden you realize that's not my Lord. I mean, 
anyway, enough of that. Let's move where it says that this, this was hidden from view. And it actually speaks that badger skin speaks of the natural man. It's when you look at the natural man, uh, as far as, as morality is concerned, you can see nothing good about him. In fact, the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. That doesn't mean that a sinner man, a man who's never been saved, a natural human man or woman, doesn't mean that they can't be good, that they don't do moral good. It just means they can't do any godly things. Because the Bible makes it plain that there's none good, there's no not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this badger skin reminds that it's like a mirror. When we look at it, we see the uncomeliness also of our sinful being. And nothing attracted to bring us to Christ as far as externally. But then the Bible says that they should make a covering of a tent of ram skin. And look at that ram skin. It's dyed red. But it's underneath the badger skin. You can't see it except from the inside. When you're inside, you can look up and see the red. It's kind of like, you know, looking at, you can't tell a believer by looking at them hardly, right? You got to, but that doesn't mean they aren't believers. If they've been born again, they're red inside. And it starts from the inside out. And by the way, I believe if it starts on the inside, eventually it'll show on the outside. But I'm convinced that there's some good moral people that have never trusted Christ and may even look like they're better than people who are believers. You know that. In fact, I know I've heard people say there's probably some, some people who are not believers and are more moral in their life than many believers. And I'm sure I've seen people that are that way. But the Bible says that they had that hidden from view in that natural man. And the Bible says this about the natural man over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot perceive the things of God. So when the natural man is looking at this tent, this tabernacle, and he sees the badger skin, then first of all, he can't see anything that would attract him to this. And the only way you can get to the inside is God has to bring you there through the system that he set up. But when you get on the inside, in other words, when you're born again and God draws you to himself, then all of a sudden, you don't, from the inside, you don't see that badger skin. You don't see that unattractiveness. You see Jesus Christ in all of his glory and all of his beauty. And God is teaching us even then is that to, to live and to walk in Christ Jesus is the most beautiful experience on planet earth. But outside, all we can see, and by the way, you'll see it shortly in just a minute, speaking about the pillars on the front, on the front of the coverings and at the veil, you'll see that it speaks, uh, all a person can see that's not a believer when they look at God, all they see is condemnation. All they can see is that brass staring back at them. And an unbeliever looking at God, someone once told me, in fact, I was talking with a young man who claimed to be an atheist, and I asked him, I said, could you, could you tell me in, in simple words why you choose not to believe in God? He said, if I believed in God, I would have to admit that there's a being that's more superior than I am, and I would have to acquiesce to him. I would have to surrender to him. And I'm not going to surrender to anybody anything. I said, Okay. Then I thought about this. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So one day, even though he chooses not to believe in God, I thought about this and I want you to hold on to it. You don't have to agree with God for God to be right. Amen. But you do have to believe in God for you to be right. Isn't that profound? can't be too profound, I thought of it. But you, that's the only way to be right, is to agree with God. So the Bible already starts to teach us that seeing this X from the outside, there's, it, we see this condemnation, we see judgment, we see, we see law, but from the inside we see grace, we see the blood of Jesus Christ, we see all the beauty that God has. And so the, the author tells us that as to be, <laughs> excuse me, that the ram skin is to be dyed red, and verse 15 says, And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of Shidon wood standing up. And, of course, these boards are going to be standing up, and they're going to be held up by tenions, what the Bible calls, and we'll see this in just a minute. And verse 16, it says, Ten cubics. And, of course, now we know ten cubics is how many feet? Fifteen feet. It's going to be fifteen feet high. That's why it stood up above 
the outside, looking at the outside from the outside over the seven and a half foot fence, you could re- readily see the tabernacle from the outside. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Tony, how would you like to have some of that to build with? A cubit and a half. That is 27 inches wide. A board, 27 inches wide, and 15 feet long. That was back when they had trees, right? (laughs) Anyway, so the Bible says also, in verse 17, in two tenions, uh, and these are actually are the, the Greek words that means hands. Two tenions is something that's going to hold, hold them together, and the word literally means hands. So the two tenions, or tenons, shall be held in, in one board set in order one against another. Thou shalt, thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle, and thou shalt and thou shalt make the boards for, for the tabernacle, 20 boards on the south side, southward, and thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver. I mean, we remember we talked to you about silver. Silver speaks of redemption, and that natural board on the outside until it's covered uh, speaks of human nature, and God's going to take redemption and offer that to hold the boards up. Listen, human beings in their own strength will never stand before God. They have to stand Hell by redemption or salvation. And so the Bible says, And thou shalt make the boards on the tabernacle, 20 boards on the south side, southward, and thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and, and, uh, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be 20 boards. And there are 40 sockets of silver and two sockets under one board, two sockets under the other board. And do you think, you would think, Lord, if you just tell them to do this on every side, but he repeats everything he wants done. Yeah, and you read this and sometimes it gets so repetitive. You said, God, I got it the first time. Are you sure you got it the first time? How many have heard the story about somebody telling you to do something, you think you got it right and you go do it. And somebody comes along and said, that is not what I said. Well, it might not have been what you said, but it's what I heard. But what we hear is not what counts, is it? It's what he said. So he repeats it over and over. And for the signs of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six board. This is on the short side, the 15-foot side. Thou shalt make six board, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it, into one ring, thus shall it be for them both, they shall be for the two corners. God built this thing to withstand the things that it dealt with on a continuum, the blowing of the wind and all the stuff, the rain, the elements. But you know something about that. If he, he didn't have to build it that strong, he was in control of the elements. It could have stormed everywhere but there if God had chosen it to be that way. And they shall, in verse 25, and they shall be eight boards and their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shot and wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five boards for the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. The bars actually held it stabilized from the inside. It was like braces, if you want to use that term. So look, begin to see it from the outside and seeing how it's constructed. It's probably in all probability. After this um, architectural genius of God, I'm sure later, and I don't know this, I can't prove this, but I have a feeling that after seeing the master at work, don't you imagine when they got to Canaan, that some of them decided they'd build their houses this way because they stood through the wilderness time. I can't prove that. And we know that a lot of them lived in tents even in the, in the Holy land. But this is, this is, this is the master's plan. And I promise you, um, he, he, anything he builds will stand all the test of the elements and the test of time. That's why when I see this, you know what I look at when I see this, I see something that God did that nobody can destroy. You know why I know that? 
I'm holding something in my hand that every atheist and agnostic in the world has tried to discredit, discredit tried, to, tried to deny, and tried to destroy. And guess what? It's still here. And it'll be here. As, as that old boy said, it'll be here when there's nothing else else here. Because the Bible says this book will meet us at the judgment seat of Christ. So watching that, let's look at the door of the tent now. In, in chapter 26, verse 30, 36, and following chapter 26 verse 36 and the and just 37 there's two it's going to talk about the door of the tent this is the outside this is what we literally call where the first veil is and then there's two veils in the temple the veils of the holy place and then the most holy place those two veils so the bible says that here's what i want you to make the door of the tent after this manner and thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent talking about the external part so that we see from the outside and the inside also. And thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of blue, heavenly color, purple, royalty color, and scarlet. We've gone over those a great deal. And fine twine linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shadow wood. I remember the name number five. God's grace being displayed right in the middle of the, as the priest walking into that, into that, constant place of ministry had to be reminded in his mind i'm only doing this by the grace of god i am only entering into a place where god where i minister the things of god and listen to me so many people want to minister the things of god in their own flesh but i gotta tell you without grace nothing really happens that means that god is the author and the power behind everything so the five pillars, the Bible says there, of shine and wood, and overlaid them with gold. These are going to be overlaid with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Now, the sockets could be viewed from the outside, I'm told, but the other elements, uh, the silver and the gold, could only be viewed from the inside. Now, why is that important? Salvation is not out here. It's not out here. Salvation and people that are brought into Christ are brought in here by the priest, by proxy, as he brings the sacrifice in. And from the inside, looking at the tabernacle from any angle, from the inside, everything you see from the inside reminds you of the blood of the sacrificial lamb, the deity of Jesus Christ, and the high price of redemption. The heavenly color of the blue speaks of the heavenliness of Jesus that came from heaven. The purple speaks of the royalty of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the, the scarlet speaks of the blood. Everything from here inside. This is why it's so hard for me, for believers, not to understand that when we look from the inside out, all we can see is the work of God, not our work, His work. He prepared everything. He caused everything to happen. And a person that walks inside this and gets any kind of any kind of glimpse of what God was doing back then can't miss that salvation is all of God, not of man. We're brought in here by God's grace. By faith, we bring the sacrifice to the door. But I promise you, it isn't our faith that takes it to the place of the majesty of God. It's grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. You're not saved through faith. You're saved by grace through faith. Do you get it? Don't get it turned around. Somebody said, well, i got faith in God. Hey, the devil's got more faith in him than you have. You know why? He knows everything about God, and yet he's so stupid he won't believe it. He, he still believes he's going to overthrow God. I will ascend to the throne of God. I will. Someone asked me a question about this terrible thing happened up in Connecticut. And I don't, I, I don't know. I still, I, I still am baffled by the evilness that was there that day. How any man, any human could shoot six and seven-year-old children, eight 10, 11 times the same child. Has to be a person without, has to be a person, in my opinion, 
that's under the influence of Satan himself. Because the Bible said he was a murderer from the beginning. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Here's what this teaches me, though. That as long as there's human beings on the earth, there'll be people that look at this and say, hmm, that doesn't mean anything. I'm going to do my own thing. And by the way, this you have that right. Every human being can do their own thing. Here's the problem is, it's not going to change what God's going to do. And it's sad to think about those kind of things, that people are, 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 are delusioned into thinking that they can do what they want to without any repercussions. Someone said, well, wait a minute. This guy took his own life. And, and I, I, I don't know this man. Now, please, I'm not picking on him. My heart breaks for his family. I cannot imagine the pain that they're having to suffer. And I'm not just choosing this person out. It could be anybody. But I want to tell you something. There's an influence in this world that wants to warp your mind so that you can't see the purity of a godly life and Jesus Christ is the author. You don't have to be a murderer. You can hate your brother. That makes you a murderer also. That's what he said, right? So, Please, take these things to heart. God is not playing. This was a requisite and a prerequisite for the day when His Son was coming to die. He was showing the world, My Son is coming to fulfill all of these types. Don't take it lightly because I won't take the death of My Son lightly at all. And I'm so glad He didn't because His Son's death Paid my sin debt in full. Somebody say amen. In full. He did not make a down payment. He paid the whole shebang. And then his resurrection, his blood gave me salvation. His death paid for my sin. But the resurrection gave me life in Jesus Christ. So he was teaching us even then. And you know there's something that I want to certainly remind you of tonight. Because we got a world that's absolutely gone totally crazy. And I need to tell you something. If you've been in this world very long, you know what I'm about to tell you is absolutely true. We are where we've never been before. There's never been the kind of anger and hatred and evil in the United States of America. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but I'm assuming the rest of the world that they are right tonight. People can slaughter babies and not bother them at all. In fact, they don't just kill them in school rooms. They kill them in the womb and get paid for it. And you know what? We that voted for the right for a woman to take a child's life, I need to tell you, we are as guilty as they are. Did you hear me? We are just as guilty is there. Their blood is on our hands too. We could stop it if we had enough people that would stand up and say, "No, no, no! I'm not going. You will not. I will not have the blood on my hands." <clears throat> I better quit. Somebody needs to say something somewhere, sometime, and let people know God sees all this stuff. And it's coming to a climax. It's evil reigns and it's everywhere that you turn your head. And God's people are just for some reason, and I'm not picking on God's people. I love them. And I know that God loves them a whole lot more than I can. But we got to wake up. God, listen to me carefully. Somebody not only needs to wake up, dear God, we need to speak up. And if you really believe what you say you believe, don't sit there quietly while people all of a sudden decide that they can just exit God from the schools and decide that God's still going to be there to take care of everything. You know, we said we don't want him here. We, I'm not speaking, I'm talking about the people of America. We don't want him. We don't want our kids exposed to that, that radical religion. Oh, they'd rather have them exposed to radical evil, I guess. I'm afraid that's it. I'll hush. No, I won't. Not long as I've got breath in my body, I won't. But it seems like it's getting awful quiet in the pulpits today. And you know, it doesn't bother me because it's quiet. And I've often said, God, they could have never, guys, they could have never cooked prayer out of school unless they'd gotten out of the home and out of the church. They couldn't take the Bible out of the school if there'd been enough Bible believers there voting. 
So we don't have any right to look at them and say, oh, how evil they are. We're the ones that let it be that way. Amen. So I accept my responsibility. Will you accept yours? Well, let's don't let it happen anymore. I, I, I'll be honest. I was absolutely appalled when the president that's in there now was voted back in. I was shocked. I could not believe. And many, many Christians voted on. And I thought, where have you been? And I'm not condemning you. You've got a right to vote anywhere you want to. But I will tell you something. God knows that's why we're in the mess we're in now. Amen. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to hush. I keep saying I'm going to hush. Maybe I don't need to hush. Tony, come on.